To spotlight the regulatory developments in North America, we connect with Tara Jacola of 3E in Oklahoma. Hi Tara, in November presidential elections are coming up. However, regulatory developments will continue and won't wait for elections. What are currently the key developments in the USA? Yeah, hi Jared. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with the rest of the ChemCon community as well as yourself today. Uh, you are absolutely right that while elections are indeed coming, the regulatory developments will absolutely continue um, and will not wait for, for that election. And so for as far as the key developments here in the US, certainly you're seeing a steeper hike in Tosca fees for, for those in industry to be aware of. Uh, when we look at the EPA has recently identified um, over 900 chemicals in the latest Tosca inventory update. And so as we look at that biannual publication of Tosca, uh, we now have um, you know about 86,000 chemicals that exist, uh, 42,000 uh, which are actually actually active in US commerce. And so at the state level, you know, we have um, California certainly being active with the OHIA air toxics hotspox uh, draft guidelines. Those have recently, uh, you know, been delivered and a public hearing is, is set for conducting health risk assessments for isoprene, uh, which is already uh, an active California Proposition 65 ingredient. As far as HASCOM, still waiting on that. It is uh, still stuck within the OMB review. Uh, we are hope, hoping for publication, though, soon this month. And, you know, that will certainly be something industry will want to keep a close eye on uh, to make sure that they're prepared from, you know, a safety data sheet authoring perspective and, and really ready for, for those, uh, those new updates. Uh, as far as, you know, on Tosca 8A7, that is that one-time uh, PFAS requirement, uh, the reporting requirement that the EPA is going to be using in order to really, you know, use that data to better characterize the sources, quantities, as well as end uses of PFAS. And so all manufacturers and importers of PFAS since 2011, as well as end users of PFAS are going to be doing that, um, are going to be required to report the biggest differences uh, for this report is that importers of articles who are, you know, discrete manufactured goods are also subject to that report. Uh, so there will be a lot of companies that are required to report that may have never had to deal with Tosca before. Um, so that's also including small businesses um, as well as those importing articles. Uh, so, you know, something to certainly keep an eye on. As always, a lot is happening. I guess industry would wish for a Teflon coating against the upcoming state PFAS regulations. However, they keep emerging. Can you tell us more about this challenging topic for industry? Yeah, sure. So, you know, just to, uh, you know, kind of maybe going back. So I mentioned Tosca 8A7, a reporting requirement. And, you know, one of the difficult things about PFAS reporting is that this regulation uses a slightly different definition of PFAS, uh, that it's sometimes difficult to ask suppliers if a product contains PFAS, because, you know, really we need to understand the definition being used. And so industry will certainly want to keep a close eye on the scope of products here, as well as exemptions. Uh, keeping in mind, this is a really important thing to, to call out that research and development substances, byproducts, impurities, recycled materials, and intermediates, uh, as well as waste, not um, excluding municipal solid waste, but those are not actually exempt from the reporting requirements. So typically when you, you have some of these exemptions, you can be off the hook but really important to understand the scope of the reporting. Um, this rule is effective, uh, you know, it, it became effective last year. And so we look at, you know, there's, we're, we're really now in data collection. It's really important to be making sure that you you have that PFAS data available. And so when we look at the, the reporting as required between November 12th, 2024 and May 8th, 2025. And so really important to, to be prepared for that one-time reporting requirement. When we look at, you know, also, uh, you know, FDA continues to allow um, certain authorized uses of PFAS in food contact applications, such as nonstick, as you mentioned, Teflon um, and rubber O-rings, as well as gaskets. And so when we look at that, you know, the FDA is considering that these PFAS molecules are present as polymerized or large molecules, uh, such as PFAS, that are not absorbed by the human body when ingested. So certainly more to, to, to come with that. Um, as far as when we look at uh, EPA and RICRA, so the Resource Conserv uh, Conservation and Recovery Act, you know, they're starting to list PFAS as uh, hazardous uh, constituents. At the state level, you know, you, I, California, always a hot, uh, hot state to really enact items. So, you know, CASB 903 
you know, really important for those to be aware of, of that, where they're looking to really ban products containing PFAS. Um, and that's really a broad ban. And so really important to, to stay connected with that. Other active states, such as Colorado, you know, they've recently uh, put a ban on PFAS in carpets, fabrics, and food packaging. Uh, juvenile products as well. And so really important to keep a keep a mind out for that. Minnesota, they've recently banned PFAS in apparel, and that will be, you know, effective in January 2025. Uh, so as you can see, there's a lot of states that are very active in this area, um, you know, not only at the federal level, but, you know, a lot of the states and then also in other regions of the world. I mean, certainly we still have, you know, for, for REACH um, and Annex 17, the restriction and tension for general PFAS, which, you know, 2025, 2026. So really important to, to keep a close eye on all of those developments. In the EU, we discuss essential uses. In the USA, you have CUU, currently unavoidable use. Is this similar or what can we expect? Yeah, so I would say right now the U.S. is, is still defining essential use. Um, you know, as far as the states, uh, Maine has actually recently defined currently unavoidable uses, also known as CUU, and that, that occurred earlier this year. And we look at that statute, you know, they defined CUU as a use of PFAS that the department uh, has determined by rule under the section to be essential for health, safety, or the functioning of society, and for which alternatives are not reasonably available. Um, so certainly more to come on you know, bringing this proposal to the legislator in 2025. Um, so there will be a public comment that recently just closed that the department's going to be looking um, at comments to see um, you know, really you know, what has industry said and, and really understand you know, where um, where products are, are being sold and distributed. And, and this is really within Maine to understand which products contain intentionally added PFAS. Um, you know, we look at essential for health safety or the functioning of society. You know, that means products or, you know, when we look at components that if unavailable would result in significant increase in negative healthcare outcomes. Uh, so inability to, to mitigate significant risks to human health or the environment, or significantly interrupt the daily functions of which society relies on. And so when we when we break it down, you know, essential for the functioning of society includes, but is not limited to climate mitigation, critical infrastructure, delivery of medicine, life-saving equipment, public transport, as well as construction. So when we look at reasonably available, you know, that means that a PFAS alternative is readily available and in sufficient quantity and at a comparable cost to the PFAS it is intended to replace and performs as well or better than the PFAS in a specific application of PFAS in a product or component. So that kind of breaks down the CEU definition, and I'm certainly sure that we will see a lot more um, coming out on essential use here. Okay, besides these developments in the US, are there specific regulatory developments in Canada we should keep an eye out for? Yeah, so when we look at uh, Canada, you know, certainly uh, when we look at the Canadian Chemical Management Plan, uh, they've recently proposed some risk management measures. Um, recently, you know, we had six substances in the phenylpropanoids and aldehydes group that have been identified as toxic, and that occurred in early February. Those in industry really may, you know, really want to look at new measures on limited uses, uh, seeking alternations and limiting concentrations. Uh, when we move to, you know, cosmetics world, uh, really important to be aware of the octanamide uh, and hydroxy, which is used in body wash, shower gel, shampoo, um, exfoliants, shaving creams. Uh, recently, there's also been some limited uses that have been proposed, as well as reporting and record keeping requirements. So while that's limited to experimental use, one must control, notify, as well as collect that waste. Uh, so really important to, to be aware of that. When we look at the dangerous goods world, you know, certainly Transport uh, Canada DG site registrations. Uh, that's also a hot topic that will be uh, within October. Uh, so many really uh, items still within Canada to also continue to be aware of and keep our eye on for those who are manufacturing or who is serving the Canadian market. Overall, in North America, there's a lot of attention for supply chain related issues. What are your thoughts on this? 
Certainly lots of emerging regulations uh, seeking to really uncover, you know, what is in our products, right? So we look at the origin of parts and materials in certain products, uh, you know, similarly to the Frank Dodd Act, uh, which was passed in 2010, which required the U.S. firms to disclose the origins of 3TG conflict minerals, such as tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold. You know, new regulations are certainly demanding evidence-based materials sourcing. Uh, so as we see in in EU, you know, the regulation on deforestation-free products, uh, which requires the traceability of at-risk ingredients like palm oil, soil, cattle, and cocoa, um, as well as derived products like beef and, and chocolate. Here in the U.S., you know, we're looking at um, similar items. So U.S. Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, also known as UFLPA, certainly a hot topic, which bans the imports of goods into the U.S. produced or manufactured wholly or in part of Zhejiang, China. So this law requires any organization wanting to import goods from this region into the U.S., to provide clear and convincing evidence that items were made without forced labor. And so that's something I know a lot of different uh, companies are looking at right now. And so another thing, you know, really moving beyond uh, impacts like supply chain emissions, you know, we're also seeing increase uh, in general within supply chain due diligence, such as the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, which was passed in 2021. You know, that was really ensuring that organizations are respecting global um, supply chains and, and human rights and certainly a, a hot topic for us to, to continue to watch today. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to seeing 3E in June in Bangkok.